Welcome everybody, good afternoon. I'm just gonna give a few seconds here while people are continuing to join us. All right, I will get started. So welcome, good afternoon. Like I just said, my name is Kelly Dean and I am the Director of Engagement at Whetstone. Whetstone is a provider of an instructional coaching platform called Whetstone and we're used in districts and schools across the country. Um, I am excited to be here today. This is part two of a three-part series on um, instructional coaching and leadership during you know, these crazy times and so specifically in remote and hybrid learning environments. Today, we're gonna to be talking uh, more specifically about instructional leadership in remote and hybrid learning environments. And uh, we are joined by Sean Gavin and he is the principal of Uncommon Leadership Charter High School in New York. And Sean's really gonna lead us through a deep dive on um, really why it's so important that we're coaching now, you know, almost more than ever. And then he's going to kind of get into what we should be coach, you know, what do we coach on right now? And when should we be doing that coaching? And then, of course, um, how do we do it? So it's going to be a great session. I think you guys are going to love it. Um, before we jump into that, I just have a few housekeeping things today. Uh, the first is... Um, the chat on the bottom of the screen, you can see a chat window. I invite you to open that up. And if you have questions throughout the presentation um, or just, uh, you know, thoughts, discussion, something, you know, you want to discuss further or later, I invite you to write uh, in that chat. It's a great way for us to have a discussion about what we're talking about and what we're learning about. Um, also, you can put questions there or you can put them in the Q&A which you should also see at the bottom of your screen. And that way, if I can answer them during the presentation, I will. Otherwise, we have a about 10 minutes set aside at the end for Q&A with Sean, and I will ask him your questions uh, at that time. So just to make sure that we are good with the chat, um, if you want to open it up, I am going to post a link in there. Let's see. Um, I'm going to post a link in there in just a second when Sean starts, okay? And that link will be for a PDF that he is going to uh, talk about. And you're going to want it now. You're going to want it later. It's, it's, a, it's a great resource. Um, so just keep that chat open and uh, I invite you to click on that link in just a second when I pull it up here. And what else do we have? During the section, the session, we have a couple polls and um, it's a great way to keep this session interactive. So, you know, I again invite you to take part in those. Um, we all learn from each other that way. And then finally, following today's session, we will be sending an email. And in that email, there'll be three links at least, but three very important ones. The first is to a recording of this session. So you can invite you to view it um, afterwards at any time, share it with your colleagues. And the second thing that you will see in that email is a, another link to that PDF that I just talked about so that you have that in case you lose it today. And then finally, a link to register for the third part in this series, which is happening on January 16th. So um, keep your eyes open for that. And I think the, that about does it for the housekeeping things today. So uh, I'm just going to announce and <laughs> introduce Sean. Sean is the founding principal, like I said earlier, at the Uncommon Leadership Charter High School in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, he started the school in 2017 with 12 amazing teachers and about 100 students and one hallway. And um, now they're on the eve of graduating their first senior class. So hopefully, um, that won't have to happen remotely, but it may. And either way, I know those kids will be totally ready for whatever is next um, in their worlds. So without further ado, Sean, I am going to hand it over to you. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, I also am very much hopeful that we do not have a remote graduation this June, uh, although who knows. 
Um, I am coming to you from snowy New York today, uh, and I'm very excited to talk about uh, coaching in a remote and hybrid context. Uh, my school back in the uh, in the spring, um, we found out on Friday the 13th that we were going to be closing down, and by next Tuesday we had a remote school built over the weekend, and we had every student uh, online. Uh, 95% of our students online taking classes uh, for a full day. Uh, we had a pretty successful spring. Starting the school year has been way tougher. I don't know if this has been your experience, but without the student relationships and built and in place already, uh, without a lot of content and habits built up over the course of a whole year, it's been way harder to start remote and start hybrid for, for us. We've certainly felt that. So we've really leaned on our instructional coaching model uh, to, to make our classes uh, as rich as possible and as inviting as possible for, for students. Uh, and so I'd like to share a little bit of what we've learned. Uh, this is not the definitive stamp on how to coach in remote and hybrid. Nobody's figured that out, but I would like to share with you some of our learnings uh, and hope to hear things that have worked for you in the Q&A as well. So um, just start out with the context of where we are. We all know that the um, amount of learning loss that is happening this school year is staggering uh, and that the burden has fall, uh, fallen most harshly on black and brown communities, communities that were already underserved educationally in this country. We also know that the burden has fallen really hard on teachers. Uh, many of you have probably read the New York Times article that came out uh, the week before last uh, about how difficult this has been uh, on teachers. We've all been experiencing that. And you know, in some districts, the number of early retirements has gone up 58% uh, because of how challenging remote instruction has been and hybrid instruction has been. And just like on a personal level, I'm sure we're all missing moments like this one in the classrooms that we know and love uh, and getting to interact with the, the students who have uh, inspired us to take on this vocation. Uh, so it has been, there have been a lot of difficult and dark points of this year uh, and last year as well. But in many ways, that to me is why we coach now more than ever why it is so important for us to pour all of our resources into making our classes uh, the, the brightest, most interesting places that they could possibly be. Uh, and so what I'll share with you today is our answers at ULC, my school, to why we coach and why we think instructional leadership matters now more than ever. We'll talk about what we coach uh, for in-person and, and hybrid, as well as for remote. Uh, when we coach, uh, it's hard to fit in all the things you need to fit in uh, right now. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about how we have made that work for us. Uh, and then lastly, um, I'm going to show you an extended practice clinic. Uh, we've really worked on our, our practice clinic model for how to coach um, in, a, in a remote and hybrid setting. Um, so that is how we'll, we'll close things out. Sean? And, yeah. Can I interrupt real quickly? Um, can it seems like we can only see the title slide. Cool. Is there, do you want, maybe you want to stop sharing and, and reshare again and we'll see if that fixes it. Yeah. How about now? Let's see. Oh, they could only see the agenda. Oh, it sounds like the presentation was fine. It was just the Google Doc that people couldn't oh, see. Oh, I apologize. No, okay. not at all. Thanks, Amy, for updating us on that. Could somebody just uh, chat at, at Kelly and I if you can see a slide that says agenda now? Yes. OK, we're good. All right. This is uh, pro proof of concept, I think, of how difficult remote learning has been. I uh, no, I don't think anybody here has gone through a meeting without some sort of tech snafu. Uh, so um, to, to begin our conversation about uh, coaching, uh, I, we'd love to hear from you uh, about the state of coaching in, in your campus right now. Uh, so we have two poll questions for you. And for the first one, uh, Kelly has just sent audience poll number one, which is a three, three question poll. And this is about the frequency of uh, coaching. Um, in your in your school. So when you think about the amount and the quality uh, of instructional coaching happening this year at your school compared to a normal year, 
which of the following statements best applies? Uh, is, is coaching happening less frequently, uh, more frequently, or about the same, but you're just doing it differently? So let's hear from everyone. All right, and I think we're ready for the poll to close. Great. Uh, so 37% uh, uh, said that you are coaching less frequently. Only 21% said that you are coaching more frequently. Uh, and 42% uh, of us said about the same, uh, and we are just doing it differently. Uh, if uh, I had to answer that question at my school, I'd say the last one as well, uh, is that we've been able to maintain a schedule where we're doing as much coaching as we did in the past, uh, but we, we've we just had to figure out ways to do it differently, and that's mostly what I'm going to share with you today. Uh, some schools that I've talked to, though, have said uh, that they're able, they're liberated to uh, spend more time on instruction. You don't have to worry about people chewing gum in the hallway, uh, which is great. Um, and then others have just said the challenges are so great uh, to our model that we do have to um, coach a little bit less. Hopefully some of the things that I share today will, if you're in that less bucket, uh, will allow you to make um, more of the, the less time that you have. And to give us a sense of the lay of the land, we have a second poll question for you too. And this is about uh, what you feel is the greatest coaching challenge in a remote or hybrid learning environment. Or is it schedule constraints? Uh, is it just teacher and leader bandwidth? Uh, everybody is physically and emotionally exhausted and having trouble to do the intellectual work of coaching. Is it the need to prioritize other topics like we've got to spend a million years on PPE and health and safety training protocols, lack of clarity around what should we coach and focus on? Uh, or other, and if you choose other, could you just put your answer in the chat? Yeah, that's real. Uh, the the winner uh, coming in was teacher and leader bandwidth is uh, a real struggle. Um, and that is something that we are very much feeling at, at my campus. Um, I'll, given that this was the number one polling answer, um, I'll try throughout this to weave in uh, ways that we have tried to um, uh, distribute the, the share as equitably as possible and kind of preserve that sense of teacher uh, and leader bandwidth so that people have have space to be good teachers and leaders on Zoom. Uh, great. Okay, so that is really helpful uh, information to know as we go in this, and I'll uh, I'll adjust some things as we go based on your responses. Uh, I just want to put down a marker to say that uh, even with all the challenges that I've named, and you came to a webinar on remote coaching, so you've probably been facing those challenges too. Uh, that transcendent teaching is still possible. Uh, and I want to start with a video of uh, this gentleman here. I get to work with him every day. His name is Javante Crawford. Uh, he started uh, last year with us, and this is his second year of teaching. And uh, if you're not in your second year of teaching, think back to that time uh, and think about what it, what it would be like to be in that stage of your career uh, at this moment right now. Uh, but Javante is a, a teacher who has soaked up all of the coaching that our Dean of Curriculum and the department chair for the science department has given him. 
And uh, I want to show you an example of what that has looked like. I'm going to show you an example of his remote classroom of discourse that's happening. Uh, it's a three minute clip. And in this clip, uh, students have just done a science experiment online. They've studied some data tables and now they're discussing the results. Uh, and as you watch, uh, the, the only prompt is, um, what is, what is Javante uh, Crawford here? What has he been able to do with his students uh, remote? And what does that say about the power of teaching right now? Let's take a look. And here it comes. Let's all bring you back, come back to the camera, and we're going to jump into a mini discussion to lead to our first stamp. So as we re review this data and we review uh, experiment number one, what does the rate of product formation depend on? What does the rate of product formation depend on? Let's hear from Cameron, Tyrell, and then Samuel. Um, it depends on the amount of enzymes that are in the in the reaction because you can see how you can see how with the enzyme each time it goes up more for the reaction to occur more faster each time. All right, Tyrell, do you agree or disagree with Cameron? I agree with Cameron. Um, why I agree is because, or uh, like, you, uh, what's it called? Like she said, with the enzyme, like, like every time, like is like every time it's used, like what's it called? The reaction like goes up. Okay. All right. And Samuel, what do you think? So I think that it depends on the enzyme, like the number of enzymes, just like Cameron and Carl said. Because when we look at it, like it says with, en with enzyme, it's under 30 seconds, eight. And as the enzymes increase, you will see that. Under 60 seconds, 19 will be produced in 90 seconds, 30 minutes. Great. You're exactly right. All three of you. All right. And why would we test no enzyme? So if we look back at the data, um, you see where it says with enzyme, and then you see no enzyme. Why would we test no enzyme? I'm looking for five hands in the next 10 seconds. Why would we test no enzyme? Let's hear from Chase. Uh, I think that we will probably test no enzyme because like lactose intolerance, there are some people that don't have the enzyme necessary to break down foods that some of us eat every day. And I think another reason would be because of a control, because in an experiment, you need to have a control, like a piece of data that that isn't the same as the data you're experimenting on. All right, Samuel is itching to answer this question as well. So Samuel, go ahead and add on. I agree with Chase and I think food without enzyme because we know that enzymes speed up chemical reactions. And I think that these ends like with enzyme just shows the rate and without enzymes, it shows how ineffective it is without the enzyme. Great job, you both are right. So the trial without enzymes serves as the control of the experiment, which um, Chase stated. And it shows us that the reaction cannot occur without the enzyme, which leads us to our mini stamp. The presence of an enzyme speeds up a chemical reaction. All right, let's. And I'll uh, just pause to give everybody a moment to uh, chat something that they noticed in Javante's clip about the 
the quality of uh, teaching. And I'm sure our science folks who are coaches on the call uh, could say like, yeah, there are definitely things you could improve about student discourse and uh, the, the quality of student responses. Totally true. But um, look, we're online. He's a second year teacher and he's getting students to actually talk to one another about an experiment and respond to what the person before them said. Uh, I think that just shows the marvelous possibilities of uh, teaching in this moment when you've got a really good coach. Uh, so if you have some observations about, uh, about Javante's teaching, go ahead and chat those. Nice. Nice. We've got some good coaches on the call who noticed some uh, powerful things. Uh, so, um, that is Javante, a second year teacher uh, and the things that he is, is able to do, uh, mostly because of his own abilities, uh, but also because he's got a few good coaches in his corner. And what I'm gonna do is describe uh, the journey of a teacher like uh, Javante. What are the coaching touch points that he gets during a week uh, that supports him in creating moments uh, in class like that every single day. So and th the thing I most want to emphasize is that whether you are hybrid or remote or even in person, that great teaching is great teaching. And I don't want to be glib about that. Online learning is a disaster. It's really tough it's never gonna match what it is like in person, but there are some elements of uh, excellent teaching that transcend the medium. And in this moment uh, of being online or being in classes where we all have to wear masks, we have to have the serenity to accept the things we can't change and the courage to accept the things that we can. And there's a lot about teaching uh, that we can provide in any format. And to do that requires strong coaching or at the very least to create a culture where great teaching happens uh, across mediums in your school, not just where the best teachers are, but in every classroom uh, requires a great culture of coaching. So that's what we're gonna talk about. Uh, not just why we coach, but what do we coach? When do we coach it? And how do we coach it? And we'll start with what we coach. Uh, the PDF document that Kelly provided in the link uh, shows you uh, our sequence of what we have decided to focus on for in-person teaching and what we've decided to focus on for online te teaching. Here, what in-person teaching means uh, is hybrid. Our context uh, in New York City is that we're able to have, in, in the school that I'm at, eight to 12 students in a classroom right now with masks and social distancing and all of that. Online teaching in this context means pure remote, everybody is on Zoom. So I'll give everybody a moment to open that document up and read through uh, what we focus on in the first few weeks of the school year. We'll take two minutes to read. Take one more minute.
Great. And uh, there was one Q&A uh, that uh, came through uh, about uh, this particular document that I'll answer now uh, at this moment, which is like, who decided on these and how? Well, what we did is we just took the um, online t the online action step sequence that we've used for about 12 years now uh, and spent the spring uh, studying our classes and saying, you know, if if warm welcome is the first thing that we work on uh, when we're in a traditional school year, how do we do that online and what's different about it? And so in the, um, the warm welcome uh, action step, uh, or the first five of class. Uh, for the in-person teaching model, we just listed on the right, um, what are the things that we need to change about this to make it work for online teaching? And so, uh, whereas in the building, you focus on like the handshake and the greeting with students and making sure that that's norm to class classrooms. For online teaching, it's making sure that the Zoom norms that everybody introduces to students as they come in a room, uh, that, that those are clearly installed in every classroom. Love to get a sense of where you feel you are uh, with your school around the, what you are coaching, the action steps that your instructional leaders and coaches are, are working on. Uh, so we've uh, listed a few that have been very much on our mind uh, around remote habits, like Zoom norms, training student technology use, around hybrid habits, like creating classroom routines and procedures around, say, submitting work. Are you focusing on uh, whether you're in-person or remote, things like clarity of directions, in-person or remote, things like discourse, monitoring academic work, or is there something else that is your school-wide focus right now? And we're probably ready to close the poll. Nice. Yeah, a really strong consensus around monitoring uh, academic work. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, we chose recently to make our focus uh, discourse. Um, and the example you saw with Javante, the example you'll see in the practice clinic is a little bit, is around discourse. Uh, just because we wanted to make uh, moments of class as interesting and inviting as possible. Um, but our, our next horizon is uh, monitoring academic work. Um, so maybe at the end, I'll ask you what you are uh, using as the, the primary drivers of monitoring academic work, uh, because that is incredibly important. You've seen what we ch chose, at least in the first few weeks of the school year, to focus on. Uh, and I think probably the bigger consideration, given that uh, as a group, we said the the bigger challenge was uh, teacher and leader bandwidth. Uh, the bigger question is, when do we coach? How do you fit this all in, in a week and make it balanced for everyone? So uh, I wanna compare what we do, uh, what levers we use when we're fully in person versus the ones that we use when we're remote. So uh, what an instructional leader usually does over the course of a week uh, at our school is observations, they give real-time feedback uh, where you might jump in on a class and, and ask a question in a certain way and then ask the teacher to uh, repeat the way that you asked that question. We have IELTS team meetings. Uh, we have a one-on-one -on -one, uh, IELTS teacher meeting. And then we have a practice clinic and pre professional development. What I'll show you in a minute is how we, uh, for both remote and for hybrid, uh, we have chosen to fit four of those five things in a week. The one thing that we decided to cut this year for a couple of reasons was real-time feedback. We've mostly found that when you're in a classroom chatting uh, feedback at somebody, uh, that for the, the teachers who need it most, that real-time feedback uh, just doesn't sink, sink through. There's not a lot of uptake on real-time feedback uh, when you're chatting at somebody in Zoom. So we decided just to take that off everybody's plates and focus on making the meetings and the practice clinics really, really strong so when teachers are, uh, or when IELTS are in a, a classroom uh, on Zoom, they, they don't give any real-time feedback, they just take notes. 
And when we're in hybrid with eight to 12 people in a room, we don't want additional people cycling in and out of the, the room. So observations just happen over, over Zoom, even when we're in the building for hybrid. How do we fit this all in a week? Uh, well, uh, for Javante, I asked Javante's instructional leader, uh, Kevin, to uh, give us his schedule. And uh, this is what Javante, the teacher you saw earlier, uh, these are the touch points that he would have with his instructional leader and that his, his instructional leader would have to think about Javante's coaching. On Monday, he observes uh, Javante's class for 30 minutes and decides on an action step. And here's what that looks like. Um, our instructional leaders go into a classroom uh, on uh, Zoom and they split screen uh, Whetstone with their the teacher's classroom and they just watch it and create a running record of what they're seeing uh, by typing into Whetstone. So what you see on the uh, screen over here is um, the running record where the teacher is just typing, the IL rather, is just typing their observations as they go. And then they will type in an action step for the teacher uh, at the end of that and share that directly with the, um, with the teacher. The real main event for the IL is then taking their classroom observations and bringing them to the instructional leadership team meeting. And what we do at the IL team meeting is a couple things. One, they practice what they are gonna do later in the week, which is their IL teacher one-on-one -on -one planning meeting. Uh, and then another thing that we do is we look across the school at all of the action steps that were assigned earlier in the week. And uh, we decide what a practice clinic is gonna look like. And it's those two touch points that I'm gonna focus on for the rest of this. Um, in, in spite, because I think uh, using practice clinics in the way we've decided to use it could be a way to solve for some of the bandwidth issues by combining uh, teachers with trends of action steps rather than trying to play whack-a-mole and hit every uh, action step that a teacher might have. So here's how we do that. Here's how we use Whetstone to uh, set up the practice clinics that we would have later in the week. What we do is we look at the action step report, uh, which is all of the um, action steps that have been assigned by our eight instructional leaders over the course of the week. And we just ask, what are the big trends that we're seeing? And from that, if we were to get all the teachers together in a Zoom room, what is the best way to use that time? What's the best way to close the most gaps by planning a session that responds to the largest number of action steps? So let me show you an example of what that looks like. Uh, here are, uh, this is actually from last week. Um, these are four uh, different summaries of action steps. Usually our action steps are like a paragraph long. Uh, I'll show you one in a minute, but this is a summary of what the action step said. IL1 said, uh, assigned the action step, engage all students in class discussion by leveraging cold call. IL2 assigned the uh, action step, prepare all students to participate in discourse uh, through and everybody writes. IL3 said, avoid relying exclusively on volunteers in class, instead leverage cold call and everybody writes. And then IL4 said, before launching into discussion, give narrated wait time. Those were four different action steps assigned by our four ILs to four different teachers. So what we did was we looked across these and we said, What's the best action step that we could use the, in the practice clinic uh, to ensure that we're closing this gap? So I'll ask our instructional leaders, anybody on the call, uh, if this were you, this were your school, and these were, were four different gaps that people had noticed, um, what would you make the practice clinic about? If you could go to the chat and, and respond, uh, I'd love to hear. This were your school, these were the gaps that IELTS were seeing. What would you make the practice clinic about?
Awesome. Yeah. Okay. So a lot of uh, convergence around uh, action steps, everybody writes, wait time. Uh, I will show you, we actually went in a, a slightly different direction. We took the idea of student engagement and um, thought about for the majority of our students who are on Zoom right now, uh, how do we uh, engage them? Uh, in a way that might be different than what's listed here and would extend and take what's listed here a little further. And so, uh, drum roll please, uh, this is what we decided to make the practice clinic about. Uh, we thought a way to work on engagement uh, in a, a very quick way is to use pull the room right before a discussion. And what that means is uh, that teachers would prioritize a high leverage uh, question, a high level question, one that would generate a lot of debate. And then they would pull a room by prompting students to uh, raise their fists or write their answers on a handheld whiteboard, uh, just hold up a certain number uh, to, to respond to that question. And then would prompt students to reveal their answers using fingers of the whiteboard. We would then batch call uh, two or three students for discourse. By batch call, I just mean Okay, let's hear from uh, Kelly and Sean and Devante. Ready, go. Uh, and then stamp the correct answer, prompt students to revise their responses. You're actually gonna get to see uh, this in action in just a moment. That's how we're going to end uh, is by going through this actual practice clinic. But I just wanna roll back the clock a little bit and go through the, or restate the process that we've gone through so far. So uh, an IL uh, observes classes, takes a running record, writes their action step. They come to the IL meeting thinking about um, what are we going to, uh, how are we gonna to pool together all of our action steps and create a practice clinic topic? We all put our heads together and look at everybody else's action steps and say, what's the right thing for us to focus on in the practice clinic? And then we draft an action step like this. And then in our school, the Dean of Curriculum goes off with this uh, and creates a practice clinic um, that is held uh, later in that week or early in the next week uh, that gets teachers practicing this action step. So um, I'm gonna show you that practice clinic in uh, just a little bit, uh, a, a highlighted version of it. But before we move on from the when we coach section, I just want to highlight some things that are uh, continuities from norm the normal school year. Uh, the first thing about what's the same is that every teacher still gets observed at least once a week and has a weekly action step to master. The second continuity, the second thing that's the same is that IL spend about 55, or, sorry, 50 percent of their time developing their people. Uh, we, we decided at the beginning of the year, we're going to make a commitment to this, even no matter what happens this year, whether we're doing hybrid, whether we end up doing full remote in New York City for a long time, uh, we're going to make sure that our instructional leaders can spend half of their time developing their teachers. And then a couple of differences that I'll just highlight is, as I said earlier, little real-time feedback is given. We just haven't seen a huge amount of uh, of excellent change come from attempts at real-time feedback. If anybody on this call has been able to make that work really well, I'd love to hear, uh, but that hasn't been our experience. And a second thing to get at the issue of just bandwidth and uh, level of tiredness uh, that is incumbent in Zoom uh, is we moved from everybody having two meetings a week to just one. Uh, every teacher just has one hour long planning meeting with their instructional leader instead of two, which is what we used to do. And the last thing, uh, not something I brought up, but uh, that I'll just name is that IELTS do spend more time giving lesson plan feedback, um, given how high stakes good curriculum is uh, for teaching well online. Okay, uh, our last poll uh, is uh, one about this question of when do you coach? Uh, we'd love to hear from you. If you think about um, the amount of time that your IELTS are able to, your instruction leaders are able to uh, coach their people, would it be less than 25% right now, 25 to 50, more than 50% of their time?
I think we're probably ready to close the poll. Cool. Self-selecting group of uh, people who are who came here because you're really committed to coaching. And uh, I, I am there with you. And I think that that is something that uh, is allowing all of our schools, uh, I'm sure, to uh, meet this moment with more fluidity than a lot of uh, a lot of places. And for those who haven't been able to prioritize it and you spend uh, less time, uh, I want to show you something now um, that we've been working on uh, that we think can maximize uh, the, the, the fewer touch points that you have with teachers. And that is, uh, we spend a lot of time developing a model around how do we make the remote practice clinics really, really work well. You've seen the process that we go through for creating the topic, the action step that we're going to work on in the practice clinic. Uh, and now I'm going to show you what that actually looks like. So the action step I just showed you uh, from last week, this Monday, uh, Chanel Simmons, our Dean of Curriculum, uh, led that practice clinic um, with a small group of our first and second year teachers. And uh, I'm going to show you an abbreviated version of that uh, practice clinic now. So um, as I get the video teed up, uh, the, the focus question I'll be asking is what steps does Chanel take to model that action step uh, and foster a strong practice? Let's take a look. Okay. Here comes the clip and the first section that I'll show is the actual model. So Chanel here, uh, who is the uh, woman in the top center, uh, Chanel is gonna be modeling the um, uh, polling. Uh, she just picks a really easy question from a novel that most of our teachers have read uh, and throws out a spicy question and then leads discourse uh, for them. So uh, as you watch this model, what does she do to effectively model how to teach uh, using Poll the Room on Zoom? Great. So for this uh, live model, uh, just give another thumbs up in the screen if you are familiar with the basic plot of To Kill a Mockingbird. Probably read it back in high school. All right, so I will treat you all as I would uh, my class. And if you're not completely sure, uh, Joe, maybe there are some aspects that you remember. Uh, just latch on to either side. For this, you will need a pen. I know it's been a really long time. You will need a pen and a blank sheet of paper. So I'll give you a moment just to get set up with that. And our uh, discussion questions are uh, very similar. Uh, what do I say and do to poll the room? And how does polling set me up to increase student engagement and participation? So what do I say and do? And how does this increase student participation? All right, and scene. Good morning, everyone. We are in store for a very juicy debate this morning. And I have been looking forward to this debate for quite some time. But before we launch into this debate, we are going to start with a quick camera check. So in the next 20 seconds, please make sure that your cameras are on before we begin. Thank you so much, Ayana. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Sajit, for already having your cameras on. Thank you for making that adjustment, Ms. LG. And thank you, Jocelyn. All right, we are at 100% and ready to go. So here is our question. Is Atticus Finch a hero? or not. Take the next two minutes to write your initial thoughts before we begin. And two minutes. Fast forward a bit more. All right, and please pause wherever you are and bring your attention back to the main screen. Thank you so much for your eyes. And Jocelyn, thank you, Ayana. Thank you, Nicole. And Saji, just pause where you are. Perfect. All right, now flip to a blank sheet of paper. And depending on your side, in big letters, write hero or not a hero. Take the next 10 seconds to do that. All right, now when I say show, you are going to hold your response up to the screen so that we can all see. 
Miss Sarjeet, are you good to go? Uh, perfect. All right, and three, two, one, and show. Joe, I can't see with your virtual background. Okay, see here. Uh, uh, all right. Okay, this is going to be a very interesting debate. Notebooks down for now. Thank you. All right, hero or not a hero, and why? Start us off, Ayana. Hmm. So both Ayana and Miss LG bring up a fascinating point that is all a matter of perspective. From the perspective of a child, perhaps Atticus is a hero, but from someone who knows the ropes of what it means to be a lawyer, perhaps he is not. So I'm interested to know, after hearing those two uh, students and those two responses, what do you think? Is Atticus a hero or not? Go back to the chat. I'm interested to see if we are staying with the answer we initially chose or changing. And scene. So we got to see there uh, Chanel model the, the skill uh, for teachers. And now they're going to discuss uh, in a debrief, um, the or what we call the name it. Uh, they're going to step back and say, uh, here's what you did that I appreciated and that I'm going to add to my practice. So we'll watch a little bit of the um, debrief that Chanel leads. Thanks. And let's move to the live remote model. Uh, polling looks a bit different here for uh, remote uh, learning content. And so what, do I, what did I say and do uh, in this moment? And then how did this set me up to increase participation? Yeah, I mean, um, I agree with everything that everybody else has said but i also just think the way that you did um the polling is is a way of like tackling several things at once like it's a way to check if cameras are on it's a way to check if students are present like behind those cameras <laughs> um it's a way to check that they have their notebooks and that they've been making notes throughout the lesson and so i think um you know, you're tackling like multiple things with the one action and the one method of doing that polling, which I think is really smart um, because you get to kind of, you know, kill two birds with the one stone kind of thing. Mm -hmm. There are a few things that you all mentioned that's super important here. Uh, one, the mention of this being more interactive for students rather than students just simply entering in the chat or pushing a button. Uh, we want to keep them engaged, and sometimes that means getting them to move and uh, write things down in a notebook and hold it up to the screen uh, so that we are getting them to be somewhat uh, mobile while they are engaged in class. A lot of what we've heard already. You'll see that my screen is split here, um, and that it, again reflects uh, the difference for disciplines. For a content like math um, and even sometimes history or science, sometimes there is a right answer. And that means that this polling might look a bit different in your context. So of course, uh, when leveraging the poll, again, this is an opportunity to gather some visual data before launching students into discourse. On the left side of my screen, you will see um, the steps to polling for a content where there is a right answer and right is right. And on the right side of the screen, you'll see here, uh, again, for a discipline like English, uh, and in some cases, history, or even science in some cases, there's maybe a bit more flexibility for students to uh, have a discussion where the justification is more important. Give you a moment to look at those six steps. So we've seen Chanel now leads uh, through the model and also through the debrief, or we call it the see it and the name it. And the last thing I'll show you is a snippet of the practice. So what Chanel does uh, next is then has uh, her uh, teachers in the meeting with her uh, take a moment to plan a moment in class where they would uh, use a technique like this. Uh, and then the next thing that she does is, uh, after they've had a chance to plan, send them off to small breakout rooms where they practice. Uh, and I'll show you a small snippet of uh, how Chanel pops into each one of these breakout rooms and continues to uh, coach the practice. 
the first breakout room is uh, the uh, the two uh, college seminar instructors. So you'll hear them uh, asking questions about the college seminar that they lead. Okay, so my kids are learning about networking and study abroad opportunities. And um, the question I came up with is, what is the purpose of getting a college education? Um, learning skills and gaining content knowledge versus networking and building relationships. So, you can so it, do you feel like that's too long? You can make that more debatable, Jamal, and you can say, which is more important, going to college mm. or networking and establishing strong relationships? Mm. Which do you think will take you further in life? Oh, wow, like that, yeah, that, that definitely changes the tonal. What is more important, networking or gaining? I'm, I'm just typing it out. Give me one second. Mm -hmm. Meaning content knowledge. Okay, so Ayana, what is more important? Gonna networking and building. Uh, Jamal, ask the question broadly before you mm. call on a student. We don't want other students to check okay, out because that, it doesn't yeah. pertain to them. Because, it, right. yeah, I call it one name. Okay, <laughs> so what is more important? Networking and building relationships or going to college and getting content knowledge? To the, sorry, to the end of that, uh, which do you think will take you further Ooh. in life? Yeah. And then you can cold call either Ayana or myself. Okay. Get ready, uh, to take it live again. Okay. So what is more important? Networking and or gaining, sorry, what is more important? Networking and building relationships or gaining more content, knowledge, and skills? What do you think will take you further? Miss Simmons. Hmm. The wrinkled or full round. So which is the dominant in this circumstance? I want you to look back in your notes, Jocelyn, and then tell me. All right, and we'll pause it there with that second practice. Uh, so we have time for a Q&A, but uh, you now got to see Chanel uh, lead us through the see it, the name it, and the do it of a, a practice clinic. And with that, that takes us through the whole sequence of, of how we prep uh, our instructional leaders to, to coach, of uh, going to observe a class, coming together to look at the action steps across the whole school, and then uh, creating a practice uh, clinic that allows us to uh, work on an action step that's shared by multiple teachers in the school. Uh, and with that, I'll end there. And um, I think we have a few minutes to uh, talk through some questions. All right, John, that was great. And uh, I can tell we have a very engaged audience because we have a whole bunch of questions. So I know we have only time for a few. I'm going to try to maybe group some and ask them together. But let's start with um, I'm just going to start from the bottom here. So do all teachers participate in your practice clinics? And what's been the response of the more veteran teachers versus, you know, the, the newer teachers? Yeah, I th so um, it's opt-in for more veteran teachers, um, but for new teachers, it's just some, uh, something that's baked into their schedule. Um, the role that the more veteran teachers tend to play is uh, is as the models. So like if somebody is really, really good at you know, one thing, and that's the topic this week. Um, we'll be like, Mike, come on in here and do the model. And uh, that's just like a way for them to showcase their expertise. Um, but it's the, the role of the practice clinics has typically been to, uh, to help our, our newer teachers who are learning the craft uh, do so. Okay, and uh, what does the workload look, for, look like for ILs in terms of like the direct teaching? Yeah, um, they do have a reduced teaching load. Uh, so an instructional leader in, in like a normal school schedule would do like three, uh, three classes instead of four or two classes instead of four. And uh, at my school, our, our coaches usually work for with one to five people. Okay, and um, how, or do you differentiate the number of action steps of struggling teachers? Um, usually you have one action step at a time and however long it takes you to master it is is how long it takes. We try not to overload people by giving them multiple action steps. So, you know, if if you're 
uh, somebody who it, it like takes you two or three weeks to work on warm welcome to your class, like that's okay. And okay, we don't and like try to pile on more new stuff. That makes sense. And then one more on action steps. Do they align to the playbook planner? Yeah, it, we I, typically in the start of the school year, we're really uh, aligned with the playbook planner. Um, but then as the school year goes along, uh, we, we tend to like differentiate a little bit more. But it's kind of nice at the beginning of the school year for everybody to be working on uh, something very similar, or at least all of the newer teachers to be working on a very similar action step. Right okay. now, for instance, in quarter two, we've moved on from the, the action steps that I showed you to everybody's focusing on discourse. Uh, we do an action step like this one, pull the room, everybody films their class, brings a video of their, uh, their film to the next PD and we discuss. Okay. And let's talk a little bit about how are you coaching your teachers in cultural responsiveness? Yeah, I think I think I saw an uh, extended question from somebody about like, how are we responding to, to Black and Uncommon through our instructional leadership? And that was that was very much the work of this summer is starting with like, how do we vet everything and revise our starting with our language? to ensure that we like, have the culturally responsive schools that, that we all want, that our students deserve. And uh, we very much took that to heart and like went from the, the, one of the things about remote learning is that it's given us in some ways the space uh, and time to think about like, even the basic fundamentals. So we brought everybody together this summer to read uh, Zaretta Hammond's culturally responsive teaching and just like interrogated all of our coaching practices um and that that led to us just revising everything from the like teacher evaluation rubric to the action steps that people receive um through the lens of culturally responsive teaching so reddit is indeed tops i've become very much a big fan um, but it's been okay. as, as a yeah. as a, a white school leader it has been a, a very powerful process for me to like interrogate my own biases and think about uh, how, how are we coaching in a way that creates a school that is truly culturally responsive. Okay, thanks for that. I'm trying to sift through. Uh, we have several. Here's another one that came in pretty early on. Um, is the coaching at your school done mainly by um, you know, the staff that worked in when you were brick and mortar? Or have you brought in specialists at all that that have coached in a virtual environment in the past? Um, it's it's just been the people who have been successful on, on brick and mortar. We haven't brought in uh, any consultants on that. Uh, maybe, maybe we should. But no, we've like, as we've done with everything, we just like, look to our, our teachers who are having the most success and just spend hours watching what they do and try to distill that into, uh, in, into things that we can share with others. Um, I, uh, I personally have been, my, my sister-in-law is a, a, a teacher of, of remote learning. Uh, she like teaches education classes. So she's been like a little on the side consultant that I've asked a lot of questions of, but we haven't formally done that. We've just, tried to distill what's working well so far. Great, well, I appreciate, and I think all of us here appreciate you sharing what you have experienced and learned and um, how this is working in your school. I wanted to thank everybody for attending today. And just a reminder that I will follow up tomorrow. You'll get an email where you can um, see the recording of this webinar and also, it'll have the link to the planner that Sean shared and talked about as well. And then one more link that is for our final webinar in the series, which will happen on January 16th. And that's all about um, how do you plan and lead a observation feedback meeting remotely? How do you do that effectively? So um, I hope you'll join us for that. And with that, I wish everybody a great rest of your afternoon and evening.